so to start, a brief agenda. We'll be talking about what Finagle is, and then a little bit of company context of why we chose to write it, um, and then go into what it actually does and go through a simple contrived code example of how you would implement a Finagle client and server. Uh, and then I'll show off some stuff that we're working on right now that are kind of skunkworks projects that the team is working on. So first, what is Finagle? Before we can ask this question, it, it's good for a little bit of context to explain why, given the company history of Twitter over the last like six years, we decided to build Finagle. <clears throat> so I guess first, uh, the elevator pitch of what Finagle is, is um, this comes straight from the GitHub project. It's an open source, protocol agnostic, asynchronous RPC library for the, for the JVM. And those are all buzzwords, and we'll go into what each of them mean in a moment. But first, for a little bit of context, let's talk about why we chose to build Finagle and how it fits into Twitter's infrastructure. So in the beginning, Twitter was implemented as a monolithic Ruby on Rails app. Uh, we were known, and this is probably still true, that we're the largest Rails app in the world. Um, so the way we scaled this was just to replicate the hell out of it. So we have a ton of Rails processes running on hundreds and then thousands of machines. Those are backed by sharded MySQL tables to store everything. So the, this diagram isn't accurate anymore. There's a, the data layer has been put in a whole bunch of other stuff. We had to like a adulterous period with Cassandra, and now we've been, we're implementing our own databases in-house. Um, but the story here is that this gets ridiculous for a variety of reasons. Um, like obviously the hardware scaling factor means that you're spending way more money on Rails machines than you really want to be. The deploy process is totally painful because like sequencing changes across hundreds of developers in a single code base becomes totally onerous. Uh, and then we had diminishing returns of optimizing the Ruby code base, so moving to the JVM or some type of more efficient runtime just made sense. But from the sort of where the boots meet the ground perspective, uh, you end up with code that looks roughly like this photo. Um, so say you want to touch the user model, you can make your change to like add a field in user.rb or something, and then you're going to have to go touch a bunch of controllers and validation code and like hop all over the code base to make your changes. And then since you're in a dynamic language, you don't have any static typing guarantees to make sure that you didn't like misconfigure some crap 10 billion lines away. Um, so this manifests in a very like non-trivial scaling factor of like developer productivity. Uh, so a common practice of solving spaghetti code bases like this is to adopt service-oriented architecture. In a nutshell, you decompose your monolithic app into a number of network services that are each exposed via some like known interface. Uh, so we use a library called Thrift for most of our inter-data center services, which comes from Facebook. Thank you, folks from Facebook. Uh, and then we use HTTP, obviously, for a website uh, to use to like expose clients and whatnot. <coughs> I guess to give an example of so, uh, um, like the way this works here is we have services for all of the core nouns at Twitter. So there's like a tweet service, a timeline service, a user service, ad infinitum, and then all these services talk to each other, and you can compose them when you're writing applications. Um, and we'll go like we'll go into an example of uh, how this code tends to look in a minute. So back to the textbook definition of what Finagle is. With a, little bit, with a little bit more context, we can go into detail of what all these words mean. Uh, first, Finagle's open source. It's on GitHub, just like a lot of our stuff. Um, it comprises about 3,000 3, commits, and there's over 150 contributors, both in this building and folks from other companies. Uh, and it's in production in a number of other companies, like Foursquare, SoundCloud, Tumblr. Um, so it's, it's used a lot, not just at Twitter. Um, I don't want this to be too much of a sales pitch, which this talk kind of already is, uh, but it's used elsewhere. Uh, so it's protocol agnostic. Twitter is built, as I'm assuming most people in this room's products are, on top of open protocols, uh, namely HTTP, Thrift, Memcache, MySQL, Redis. Um, so you want, if you want to centralize your RPC system in a single library, it's a good idea to make it protocol agnostic. It's the same philosophy that Netty has, and Finagle espouses it as well. Uh, as much of a buzzword as async is, it's what Finagle is, just like Netty. Um, asynchronicity, asynchronicity is a better way to represent networked computers, generally. Like, with any given call, there's a, a degree of latency and a likelihood of failure that's inherent in that call. So representing that via an async interface so that you sort of decouple the issuance of a request from the response 
lets you better utilize the hardware that you're running on. And again, these last two pieces are basically like why we chose Netty. Um, we could have implemented Finagle on top of raw Java NIO, but we would have ended up having to implement most of Netty to get like the connection management and to get all the goodies from like, you know, encoding in the pipeline, we would have all had to do by hand on top of NIO. Uh, so Netty provides a really solid base on which to build uh, an RPC system at the end of the day. Uh, and then it's for the JVM. It's written in Scala on top of Netty. Uh, and we use it quite a bit in Java here at Twitter. But like theoretically, you can use it from Clojure or any other JVM language. So now let's talk about what Finagle actually does and then dive into some code. Um, so basically, it standardizes the edges in your network diagram. So in this simple example, there's a single client talking to four backend servers. Um, and then what Finagle will do is just be the arrows, effectively. So it'll load balance requests across these four servers in whatever way you configure, basically, which we'll get into. Um, and the abstractions that Finagle provides are sort of summarized in this paper by my colleague, Marius Erickson, who is kind of like the father of Finagle with another guy named Nick Callen. Um, so the point being here is it's, it's leveraging functional programming in that it's sort of boiling RPC into like a function interface in the sense of like a Haskell function. Um, and it, it's a lot of blog posts have been written about how functional programming is good for concurrent software. Uh, and we kind of espouse that here, meaning like stuff like immutability and referential transparency and being able to like, dare I say it, do a monadic uh, composition of futures and stuff is very useful for building uh, sort of type safe, robust services. This paper, yeah, I don't want to like this. There's a lot of text for slides, sorry. I was just saying how like you can go read this if you want to. Uh, so to give sort of context on the code we'll be going over, the core of Finagle is this service interface. This is simplified for the purpose of this talk. Um, like a service in reality is like a trait and has a bunch of other type annotations. Um, this is Scala syntax, but effectively this means that Service is a type that takes a request object and returns a future of a response. Uh, and a future here is, is equivalent to a Netty channel future, basically. It represents an, an asynchronous computation that will either like succeed or fail and return a result or an exception, respectively, in the future. Uh, so what this ends up looking like is you have two boxes, a client and a server. The clients issue requests to the server, and then immediately you get a future of a response back. And then when the server responds with a value or something, uh, the future will be satisfied on the client. Um, but point, going back to the asynchronicity piece, because the request is fired off and the future is returned immediately, the client's free to like do whatever the hell it wants while it waits for the response. Um, so when I said the hardware is better utilized, it's basically because of that, because you're not sitting on your hands blocking for a lot of the time. So let's go over a contrived example. This is pretty simple, but just to show how the, the services and filter abstraction works. So these first four lines, we are creating a simple HTTP service. Most of this is boilerplate, but it's basically an echo server. Uh, you just take a request to return 200 OK with the body of the request. And then that last line, we're serving this service on port 80. And the annoying part of so there's a difference between a service and a server, which are very confusing, and we deal with this all the time. Like a service is a finagle abstraction that's just a function, basically. Uh, so clients and servers are both services, but so you can they're like symmetric, effectively. So th this is a service that is a server, and you serve it on port 80. And then this next slide is a client that's going to talk to the server that we just created. Uh, so it, you create a service to talk to localhost 80. And then you issue a request for the root. And that request response, sorry, the response you get back is a future. And here we're just mapping over the future and then printing the result. So if you ran this, it'd just print the result effectively. Uh, so now let's say you want to authenticate requests. And this is a means of introducing another abstraction in Finagle called filters. Uh, so the core of Finagle is you have services and filters. And in the same way that a Netty pipeline is kind of chained together, um, Service and filters are sort of equivalent in that it's like a way to compose functionality. Um, so let's look at the type signature of filter really quick. It, it, just like service, it takes a request and turns and returns a future of a response. But it also takes a second service argument, which you can kind of think of as a continuation in that a filter is a way of writing protocol agnostic functionality that 
does logging or stats recording or something that's generally useful for services and then passes on the request to the next service. Um, and this, this piece is especially simplified, but because of like the input types and the output types of filters, like the actual signature is pretty nightmarish. But for the purposes of the slide, you can just assume that the types of the, the request and the service underlying are the same. So this changes our block diagram uh, in that the client and the server are services. And then you can have however many filters you want in between them. So let's, for the purposes of the example we're walking through, you have the HTTP server and the HTTP client, and then one of those filters is going to be some authenticator um, on the server in particular, which we can now implement. So given, given an isauth function that just takes the request type and returns Boolean, let's write a simple filter that will authenticate the request and either pass it on or fail it with an access denied exception. So that's, that's literally what this is doing. So you have a filter that takes a request and a service, if the request is authenticated, you apply the service to the request and kind of just like hand it down the chain. This would be similar to just like invoking the write on, or writing a, a, a Netty pipeline handler that sort of interposes a write method and does some logging or something and then fires off a write down the channel. This is kind of like the finagle way of doing that equivalently. So in, in the failed case, we return a future exception of an access denied. Uh, so this is a common pattern where you can short circuit uh, finagle services. So if you have some authentication method and you want to like fail a request immediately and not do any further handling, you just return a future exception like high up in the chain and then none of the rest of the crap will happen so you can sort of fail fast. So then in the bottom line, uh, we're just composing the auth filter with the server that we implemented before. And and then is just like Scala magic for function composition. So a more realistic example of how things tend to look in service here, at least. Uh, so if you want to do a bunch of instrumentation on your filter, you just like chain up a bunch of crap with and then. So this, this will apply the auth filter we just implemented, uh, and then trace the request, log the request, record the request. You can see how like you can split up uh, these first four filters are going to apply to like any service. So you can write them once and then share them across like n teams. Uh, and then each server can make use of the same code. So it's a good way to not only separate concerns, but reuse stuff. OK, cool. Uh, so the, this is kind of like the advanced uh, new hotness phase of the talk. So these are all areas of, th of, like, areas of things that uh, we're actively working on right now. Uh, so first, service discovery is another fun buzzword that you read about on Hacker News a lot. Finagle has its own service discovery mechanism that's called Resolver. This is effectively a class that provides like a pluggable service discovery mechanism. Um, and a lot of the concepts behind this are documented on the Finagle user guide. Uh, the TLDR is like there's this resolver class that you can implement however you want. The default is just to use like inet addresses. So in, in the example before where we resolved localhost port 80, it's using that inet resolver and just looking up localhost port 80. Um, and these are keyed off by a scheme. So there's resolvers for a bunch of different schemas. This example is using Zookeeper, which is a more realistic example of what we do here. Meaning um, you register your clusters as like a set of addresses in a Zookeeper node, and you can watch it and get like periodic updates. So what this is doing is looking up in Zookeeper like the path to your service. Um, so there's a bunch of ways you can interpose this gobbledygook with like some usable interface. So you can ask for like the user service and then delegate the user service string into something like this. Uh, so we're building a bunch of tooling and like name server technology to be able to do this, uh, which hopefully, I mean, will be on GitHub eventually, so stay tuned to the user guide. Next, once you've resolved a set of hosts, you want to be able to load balance requests across them, um, meaning it's like it's kind of cool to have a bunch of hosts, but you want to be able to have a policy to distribute load across a cluster. Um, so this could be like round robin, which is very simple. The default in Finagle is to use uh, kind of a rough least loaded approach. It uses a heap to track, or a heap where the priority is the number of outstanding requests to any given server, so that you're guaranteed for any given request, you're going to be sending it to the least loaded server based on how heaps work. Um, so this, this is great for the steady state, because the least loaded property is good when everything's humming along. But one problem we've encountered in production is when, hope, when you have redeploys going on, like new hosts will come up with a priority of zero. And because of the heap priority property, you just like pound the hosts as they come up. So we've had a bunch of, not really incidents, but just 
success rate drops that shouldn't happen because of this sort of initial thundering herd on redeploys. Um, so one, we sort of started experimenting with a bunch of different load balancing policies, like whether it be using a more realistic latency metric to prioritize the heap, or simply like the easy fix would be just to not initialize the heap with zero when hosts come up. So if you initialize with a number that's like somewhat around where the rest of the heap is, you're not going to send as much load. And like depending on the application you want, you might want a different load balancing strategy. But the point being of all of this is like all of these features are composable and you can just implement your own like resolver or load balancer or whatever and then stick it in your Finago client. Uh, so next, well, like we use Thrift a ton. Like all of our internal RPC services are passing data around via Thrift interfaces. Um, and one kind of annoying part, no offense Facebook folks, with Thrift is that it's a serial protocol, meaning you can only have one outstanding request on a single connection at any given time, um, which is fine. But like it's annoying when you have, or that means in order to get request concurrency, you need to open up a ton of different client connections. Oh, uh, you should open source it. Is it? Oh, it is? OK. Maybe we forked it enough. Um, <laughs> So how this works here is uh, all of our Finagle clients are like way overly configured because you have to configure the host connection limit for like every single connection, which is insane. That's not something that users should have to worry about. Uh, so if we go back to that example of a single host talking to four servers, each one of those blue lines is going to be like n little lines, which are all separate TCP connections. So it's like a pain to configure and is very error prone when folks are using Finagle. Um, and also, you're just you're not utilizing a single connection, um, so it's wasteful at the end of the day. So we've implemented a, a generic request multiplexing protocol called MUX, which sort of solves this by whenever you issue requests, it tags them with some long, and then it's just a way of like correlating responses to requests. So you can send as many requests on a single connection as you want. Um, and one nice characteristic of that, of that and the way we implemented it is it, it provides a rich session layer. Um, session in like OSI layer five sense, um, if we hearken back to a networking class. Uh, so that, that lends itself well to this final piece I wanted to talk about, which is a very broad topic of uh, optimizing tail latencies. A lot of this work is derived from um, Jeff Dean's infinite wisdom from Google. He has a paper called The Tail at Scale, which provides a bunch of policies you can put in place to reduce like your P99 and above uh, for services. Um, one of them is like backup requests. If you know that a, if you track latency of a client server connection, you can tell like if the request is likely to exceed the P99, you can fire off a backup request to a different server and then like fiddle with timeouts to make uh, your latency overall lower. Um, but the, the session layer piece that I just talked about, one thing we're starting to experiment with in production is a feature called GC avoidance, um, which Via this session layer, servers, when they're about to go into a full GC, can send back pressure to clients to be like, don't send me requests. And so you like, for services where GC is a large impactor on tail latency, you can basically like, eliminate, theoretically, uh, that, that impact. So we're starting to see some good results of, it basically gets rid of like, the latency imposed by GC for clusters with a lot of hosts. Um, so that's an example of a feature that is afforded by a strong session layer which is a pretty cool thing because not a lot of RPC systems have that.